yes we're back with another episode another rider today we're honored to have keith and his lovely wife in the house all the way from victoria zimbabwe. falls in zimbabwe yeah zimbabwe victoria falls and he's a man who loves nature and he started his own safari company 40 years ago we're just going to see what it takes to be Keith and his lovely wife and run the show. So nice to have you here today, Keith. Yeah, Simon, thanks very much. It's always nice to catch up with uh, people from around the world. Eh? <laughs> so what made you want to start a safari company? As a young boy, really loved uh, just wildlife and seeing animals in the bush and being out in the nature eh? and, and being with people out there. That's been my love since I was a kid. Okay. When was your first encounter with a, a dangerous predator? Oh, well, I was probably eight or nine years old. Eh? Bumped into elephant and lions and, and uh, buffalo and all sorts of things. The nice thing is I had a, an old guy that really was a very experienced bush guy who taught me about, the, about being in the bush and being with wild animals and how you treat wildlife with respect and you know how you can sort of make dangerous, potentially dangerous animals less dangerous just by knowing how to actually approach them. So is there any animals that you would not approach regardless of? Probably, I mean, the one that causes the most strife is, is generally hippo. And that's mostly at night time. Yeah, so when you're walking near a river at night, you need to be really careful around hippo. They, sadly, they don't have a very big brain and, and they're like a giant Pac-Man. So the, the animal I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm, most, I'm most scared of is a hippo. <laughs> okay. You know, and during the day, I mean, like if you walk up to elephants properly, you know, get the wind in your favor and that sort of stuff, they'll generally leave you alone. And even lions, I mean, during the day, lions will leave you alone. And, you know, most of 99.9% of the time, if you bump into them during the day, they'll run away from you. Really? At night time, you know, at night time, the rules change, you know, especially with lions and hyenas and, and hippo and elephant for that matter at night. It's a different, you know, night and day is two yeah, yeah. different things. Sounds like the world of the of any big city, really. <laughs> it could be, you know. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're okay during the day. Mm -hmm. So, what's your out? What, so you do Botswana, Rwanda, Kenya, South Africa, and Tanzania, Tanzania. Namibia, and Zimbabwe, and Zambia. What's your most preferred country for wildlife? You know, each one of them have got a special a special piece to them. I mean, it's really hard to say you know one country over another i mean obviously being born and bred in zimbabwe and it's home you sort of got a natural sort of home instinct from that perspective but actually each of the countries are unique in their own way in the form of as a different wildlife experience and you know in and today which is which is also really cool is to be able to experience the different cultures in all the different countries i mean on a daily basis we've got probably i think it's just over 48 different cultures and tribes of people that work for us. Immersing yourself and learning about all the different cultures alongside the wildlife experiences is rich and unique. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, there's a lot going on different. I found that when I used to live in Kenya and I had my own businesses, and one of the guys didn't want to get a, what's it, inside seat or something like that because of some suspicious tribal yeah. thing. <laughs> exactly, you know, and it's, it's all very rich and interesting, you know, be it through the Maasai people in, in parts of Kenya and versus up in the north with the Samburu people, mm. you know. And it's just how you how you greet people with respect and how you learn how to actually, let's mm. say, operate in the two different tribal groups. Mm -hmm. um, and they're both, you know, they, they're all unique in their own way and that you can go through all of the countries and it's, it's very similar. And it's a very enriching experience and rewarding experience. You know, I want to say embracing where you are and, and who you're with. Now, what does it take to run a, a wildness empire? Because you've got an empire when I think of it. Yeah, the website it, looks professional and there's a lot going on. You said you've got 3,000 staff? Just, yeah, over three, sort of approaching 3,500 staff across across the world. And, you know, most, the bulk of them are in Africa, but I've got people here in London, I've got people in the US. You know, obviously those are salespeople and all sorts of things. Because the bulk of our, our market, uh, the actual tourists that come out and visit us, are coming from either the UK, Europe, or the US, or Canada, and, and Asia, for the, you know, mm -hmm. so across the world in reality. So do you give them a brief on how to conduct themselves when they're coming over? 
Very much so. I mean, it's a case of, you know, when you're talking to the, the potential customer in the future, it's, you know, they want to know what kind of experience they're look, looking for. I mean, most of them are looking for wildlife. Yeah. And a, and a variety of degrees of luxury. And I mean, some of our lodges are, ext- are extremely luxurious. I like the glamping, they call it glamping. Well, it's this, this probably, it, it's a, a lot more luxurious than glamping. <laughs> These are seven star lodges okay. and well, a lot of them are. So it's, it's, it's serious luxury in the, in the wild. So describe to us, what's a seven star lodge incorporate? So all of our lodges are, are tented lodges and and we, so we've got you know, canvas and wood generally is the materials for construction. And the reason we do it that way is, is that we're in extremely wild, remote areas. And we want to leave as, as little a, a, an impact on the ground that we operate on from an environmental protection uh, perspective. So we're very careful environmentally to leave us, you know, so we don't use concrete to build with. We use canvas and wood. So in the event that they say we leave an area after 15 or 20 years, we should be able to take everything away and, and have no trace that we were ever there. But uh, I mean, you're talking about, you know, a room will be about 130 square meters. So a it's room. a big bedroom. That's one bedroom? Yeah. Ah. I mean, they're more sort of like, a, let's call that, it a tented suite. That you know? sounds like it's for an Arab and his wives. Well, yeah, we get a lot from the UAE of customers, very much so, so and, and obviously, it's point our market's pointed at the high net worth individual and it's yeah it's so it's very luxurious and the food's very good and and the service very good but still i mean the the key part is is obviously always the people and your guide is probably your most important part is the person who you're spending seven or eight hours a day with showing you the wildlife and teaching you about how how it works together you know because you know wildlife is ever moving and you know, explaining why does it happen? Like if you take the migration in Tanzania and Kenya, you know, why does five million animals move? And it's it's really that they move. Many? Yeah, oh, wait, they, they're all buffalo. Or no, they're, they're all wildebeest and zebra primarily, and they move simply for food. Uh, you know, as the rain moves north, the the, the animals follow it, follow the rain north for the new grass that's growing post the rains, and mm-hmm. then when the you know when they've eaten all that grass, and then the rain moves south. In the because they in East Africa they have two rainy seasons, they have what they call the short rains and then the long rains. So the short rains are in November, so the wildebeest follow that up uh, from the southern part of Serengeti into the Masai Mara. They'll get to the Masai Mara in sort of late August mm-hmm. and September, then they're in Kenya, and then it starts raining in the south again in the long rains, which come in April, May, and that's you know, sort of around November, December time, all the wildebeest move back from Kenya down to Tanzania in the south mm-hmm. to drop their youngsters in normally December, January, February in the southern part of the Serengeti National Park. And you know, that's, so you, in those areas we quite mobile in the sense of we've got lodges that move with the animals because once they've moved the, the bulk of the animals in that area have now gone. Yeah, so I mean all those kind of things are really interesting and that's where your guide plays a really important role. So where do you get the guides from? Are they local tribesmen or what are, who are they? 99% of them are local tribesmen from the local areas. And you know, so it's, it takes years and years of training from a, you know, to get a, a youngster coming in and training them to be a, a professional qualified guide. I mean, generally speaking, to go from sort of scratch to getting your, your license to be able to take people out is generally between three and four years. Now. I saw this on Joe Rogan, and you're, an ex, you're probably the man to ask. You know when you sit on the, that jeep, and there's no cat, there's no roof? Yeah. And there's a man, like a guide man, sitting on the front. Yes. And there's lions walking around. Yeah. I understand that the lions see that peep, the people as part of the vehicle. Correct. Has there ever been a moment where the lions realised, ah, if I just grab one, not necessarily in your tour, yeah. not in your company. Yeah, I think, don't want to thank God it hasn't happened in our company. But, but have you I ever know. heard of a situation like that? Uh, yes, sadly, yes. Okay, so if you're sitting very still, yeah. you become part of this big vehicle. You know, if, if you create any sudden movement or like quite, it's called it a violent movement of reaction. The animals pick up movement very, very quickly and very easily. Mm-hmm. 
And the key part of something like that happening is that if the, the guy sitting on the front is sitting still and is, and is comfortable sitting still there, 99.99% of the time he's as safe as a house. Having said that, is, is, you know, things can go wrong and they, they have gone wrong. You know, fortunate enough not with us, but it's a case of I certainly have heard of it going wrong. What, what, uh, what did you hear when it went wrong? Do you, do you know what the person did? Or? Well, you know, I, I mean, you hear stories. I mean, I haven't personally seen it happen, but, you know, you hear stories with the, the individual move violently. But it can also be a case of that the, animals, the animal that's walking past could just have a, a toothache, you know, or it's an older cat that's hungry and they see a movement and they've gone for it because they're hurting. A lot of accidents happen, you know, and, it, and they can happen for multiple reasons, be it an elephant hitting a vehicle or, and quite often that is the animal's been injured. And it could be, when I say injured, it could be burnt in a bushfire and is angry just because obviously you can imagine the pain that the animal's in. And, you know, they, they do like break a tooth and got toothache. And that happens. Okay. Um, and then they can't really chase prey, so they just, correct. So they just take you because you're a delicatessen. Yeah. Correct. You know, so it's. I mean, you know, you, you've got to understand that catching humans is an awful lot easier than catching an, a wild animal. They <laughs> they're much faster and and bigger and stronger than we are. You know. What have you learned about doing business as a safari owner founder that you wish you knew when you had started? I mean, I, I think. The, probably the key thing is, is firstly, it, over the last 40 years that we've been in business, is is that the level of let's call it service and the desires of the the customer has changed dramatically over the 40 years, and and changed seven or eight or nine times over that time frame, mm -hmm. and it's always constantly changing. I mean, I think in the beginning, when you you know obviously when we were much younger, is we didn't necessarily realise the importance of people as much as today. I mean. At the end of the day, the, the business is successful simply because of the people. You know, at, to run a, you know, building a lodge with all due respect is, is easy. That just takes money. To run a, a great hospitality business takes people and good people doing their job really well. So, I mean, that's the fun part of it is when you, when you see really good people operating, that's what actually makes the business a real success. Okay, when, it's when you get good things on social media said about you yeah stuff. you know and also you, when you you know when you're dealing with happy people and your staff are happy that happiness uh, actually enhances the experience for you as a customer or as a mm. we call them guests okay mm. and we call them guests it's because like you're inviting you want to you want people to feel like you're inviting them into your home in reality and that's where happy people create happy and great service I'm just thinking all the different parts. Timekeeping. I always found that an issue when it comes to doing business in Africa. How do you manage that with your local staff? Because I know all of them are not time. <laughs> <laughs> They're not good at timekeeping. Um, you know, I mean, I think because a lot of our people are flying in on small airplanes uh, to uh, yeah, small remote air, dirt airstrips in the middle of nowhere, you know, making sure that you're on time to pick people up in the middle of nowhere is, is really important. So. At the work level, at, on the ground, is we don't really struggle with timekeeping. Where we struggle with time in Africa as a whole is quite often at, let's call it, at the bureaucratic, at government levels, you know, like getting a permit, which, you know, in theory should take, say, a couple of days, you know, can take months. So the, the, the urgency at, at, let's call it, uh, some of the, and, you know, it's not always, it's not always the, let's call it, the higher level of government you know, you're dealing with county councils and... They all want something so, small. Yeah, so, you know, some of the simpler stuff like licensing your vehicle, you would think as you go in and have your vehicle checked and you get a license a couple of hours later, well, sometimes, sadly, that can take a week, you know. And that's where we struggle with, let's call it timekeeping. And there's some countries where, you know, I might have four people employed and, they, and their job is simply to be in a queue getting another license. And that's their full-time job. Really? Yeah. That's how bad things are. <laughs> in some areas, yeah. Not, uh -huh. Thankfully, not all areas, but That's in some areas, yes. Yeah. You just got people just sitting in queues to get permits. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, there's, there's a couple of countries where that literally you've got people that's this full-time job is standing in a queue. It's Kenya, one of them. 
Sorry? Is Kenya one of those countries? In some areas, in some like distinct areas, Kenya is one of them. But in, in like its senior government level, it's actually pretty efficient. I mean, the most efficient country, I would say, in the world is Rwanda. Oh, yes, you can get permits overnight to start investing in, yeah. in uh-huh. Rwanda. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, you need to have a proper plan. But if you've got a proper plan and it's approved, there's no wasting any time or energy on getting the permissions to, to build or to employ or to actually do business. I mean, they, they're so hungry to get people to get up and running. I mean, and they are ruthlessly efficient. Okay, that's good. Uh, it's nothing like a dictator. Well, you know, I, I wouldn't want to call President I'm Kagame a dictator. Kagame. But, yeah, but you have to, op- I, uh, my attitude is I always believe that when a nation has just got their country back, you need a strong man yes. to govern them, to put, keep everybody from fractioning, and then there's got chaos. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I certainly don't disagree with it. It's a case of, obviously, with the horror that the people of Rwanda went through, it, it certainly required strong leadership to get it to where it is today. I mean, it's phenomenal, you know, if you take it, it's not that long ago, it's 1994 to today. Mm-hmm. and. To get the country to where it is today is, is an, a remarkable achievement. And, you know, knowing the, the individual personally, I rank him as one of the great leaders oh, in the world. Oh, you know him personally? Yes, oh, yeah. You, you, uh, do you say you probably know a lot of people of power based on your fact of your, your business and what you do? Yeah, and it's, like I say, it's, if you take President Kagame, you know, when you speak to him, he's very sw- softly spoken yeah, on, on the I've, one hand, and he listens. But once he, you know, once he's made his mind up, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, I like that. And he's the man who's sure. He's listened. You, you gave your argument. You weren't convinced at all. You were. Yeah. And that's it. And that's it. And you know, the the beautiful part is, is you know, even let's say there's a bit of an upset for whatever reason, is you can go there and say, look, I, I made this mistake. I'm I'm sorry. You know, can you help me fix it? And and they will jump to help you fix it. I mean, that's a that's a remarkable uh, human uh, belief. Oh, okay. Do you have a tra- you have internal training programs then? Yes, in all the different countries, training people to be housekeepers, chefs, and waiters, and guides, and so there's continual training going on on a daily basis throughout the, all the different countries. Uh, so, I mean, it's important that you sort of train the next, always training the next generation. That's, that's critical. On the other side of the coin is probably one of the most wonderful things about Africa as a whole is the people's desire to learn and to get further education mm. is, I mean, it's second to none. I mean, it's really, it's fabulous. You know, if you make the effort to actually just provide a little bit more education and training, I mean, the buy-in from your staff is spectacular. What's been the biggest hurdle for you in life? I mean, look, look, COVID wasn't a very pleasant experience. <laughs> so, That's I mean, point, you Two know, years of no of no income and you know trying to keep a business alive and and your staff paid and alive during COVID was was certainly the biggest thing hurdle I've ever faced in my entire life. It's also the saddest in so many ways in a sense of in Africa, you know, 2020 in in the big bulk of Southern Africa it was also a huge drought. And I've never seen starvation in Africa like I saw in 2020. Which, yeah. you know, just when you, when you see people starving at that scale. Do you was, think it's also due to dams and things like that? Well, factories, you know, major factories as well? Yeah, you know, so I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is, is you know, the whole, whole country's closed. I mean, you know, it didn't matter where you were. I mean, and the, the hard part in Africa is, you know, the governments didn't necessarily have the wherewithal to support all their people. You know, unlike parts of the Western world where there was support mechanisms. You know, sadly, that isn't available in, in the bulk of Africa. Here they just printed more money. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Go for your guys. <laughs> yeah, I, I see you indeed. Now, what comes to mind, I don't know how this affects you, if it affects you at all, is poaching. You know, poaching comes and goes. Let's call it. There's two forms of poaching. There's poaching that goes on for families that are feeding themselves, and it's uh, when you see that kind of poaching going on, you know, it's generally for smaller animals, for because they need to eat. Mm-hmm. 
then it's a case of how do we create economic opportunities for those people in other areas where they don't need to poach to be able to, to be able to afford to eat. I mean that kind of poaching is it's always it's, it will always exist and you know but it's but the damage it creates is actually not that great. And then you've obviously got the, the hardcore commercial there's quite a commercial poaching on you know rare species like rhino and elephant and and lions you know that that is actually all for for sort of it's called it getting export to Africa uh, sorry to Asia okay but what I heard I don't know if this still goes on in South Africa you've got people who have massive I'm not sure what you call them safari it's like a safari but the rich Americans go there and shoot the animals for sport Oh, very much so. I mean, that's... In Doesn't the hunt- that defeat the object? That one part is trying to save the other parts, having them killed off for fun? I mean, there's two, there's two sides of that. that let's call it argument stroke debate. Okay, is, is this, uh, let's call it managed wildlife parks. And, you know, if, if it's totally fenced in, areas will get overpopulated with animals pretty quickly. So there's... And they have to... Because man's fenced it in, Man needs to control the populations within that boundary. So there's that kind of, let's call it, population control that's required in one form or another. So it's like a zoo. Yeah, yeah it is actually just, it just could be a very big zoo, you know, like 50,000 acre zoo uh, mm-hmm. or 100,000 acre zoo. Effectively, you've, you know, you've trapped animals in and they, as long as there's food, they'll breed. You know, if you don't, if you don't control the population, they'll run out of food and then they'll die of starvation. So. There's bits and pieces of everything there. And then, I mean, there is, it's called it uh, commercial licensed hunting in a variety of countries across Africa. I mean, we don't like to hunt as all as an individual or as a company. But, you know, I'm not saying that it's completely wrong. It's, it's a case of as long as it's done properly and licensed and, and regulated properly, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily damage everything. Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying. To me, it's just strange that one part's doing one thing, the other person, the other part is kind of doing exactly the opposite. Yeah. In, in that respect, it just doesn't, I mean, it doesn't make sense. But it, yeah, it, yeah, in some areas it doesn't make sense. But, you know, I mean, so from a point of view, is, I think, you know, a lot of people talk about a variety of populations. I mean, what's also not talked about in the same, let's call it, sentence is, you know, there's an awful lot more people today in in the yeah. world than there was a hundred years ago, and there's not necessarily the land available or it's the habitat of available it's to. Loads of land in Africa. Yeah, you know, because you know, people are taking up an awful lot of space. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Also, the, the like in Botswana, the local people, it's their tradition to hunt. Yeah. You know, the, the bushmen, that's how, they that's their survive. life. Do they do it with rifles though? Or do they do it with their uh, traditional weapons? Because uh, there's probably a bit of a difference there. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly there's still a number that are doing it with traditional weapons like bows and arrows or spears and that sort of stuff. Yeah. And but don't get me wrong, there's also some that are doing it with rifles. I mean, there's certainly still, especially with the sand people, which you know, yeah. it traditionally were called bushmen, but the right the right name is the sand people. Sand people, okay. And you know, that's the that's their life. Um, yeah, Maasai used to do that as well. With the lions. Yeah. To get the lion suit to prove you're a man, isn't it? Yeah. But then the powers that be had them stop it. Um, things like that. Correct. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I, I know that if you're walking around in areas of both Kenya and Tanzania with the Maasai people, you know, if, you know, you know they the sort of traditional dress is that red yeah, they, blanket. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen lions where they see a couple of, of men in the traditional dress walk over a hill and the pride of lions are last seen disappearing over the other hill because they, they've, got, they've got great fear and respect of the Maasai people. Yeah, you know? yeah, I was told that they have different blood than Maasai. Yeah. <laughs> That's what my little partner said. She said, yeah. um, they don't fear people. That's why you can get a Maasai who'll be security on his own. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, out in the wild, they definitely know th- they know the wild and they're definitely not scared of the wild. Maasai are the only tribe in Kenya that's allowed to walk around with weapons. Yeah, also the Saburu up north. Oh yeah. So I went to see them and everybody, every male had a weapon. Yeah, of some description, yeah. But they, they're quite similar to their Maasai. Very similar, yeah, yeah very similar. Looks, height, all that kind of thing. 
it's quite interesting. You know, you, what always makes me, uh, I want to say, laugh is, is and because it puts a smile on my face, is there's, there's this guy in this full on traditional garb and, and a spear walking around, but he's also he's also got a cell phone. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, so that, that always puts a smile on my face. You know, that's the beauty of someone who's holding his the practicalities of his culture but also just using the bits he needs for the western world yeah it's beautiful so yeah i never understood when i was in kenya how especially as i lived in mombasa how people would wear jeans and a shirt or smart shoes in that weather yeah i just didn't understand i was constantly in a vest and shorts and flip-flops yeah <laughs> There's some form of sandals, and even then, I wish I could get less clothes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just free, and I used to say to them, I don't understand. It just wasn't practical to me the way I looked at it. But you know, but yeah, uh, you know, again, it's a great sign of uh, I want to say pride for those people to be dressed out smart, even though it's you know it's 40 degrees centigrade and probably 80 percent humidity. You know? Yeah, I just to me, it's just it's like it didn't make sense. What does the future hold for your company? I think it's a very bright future and I think there's, there's an amazing opportunity in the future. I mean, there's no doubt that the younger generation, especially since post-COVID, that the younger generation, I want to say, care a lot more about the planet than maybe the older generations mm. necessarily did. Would you say that's the wealthy or would you say that's all round? I think that's all round. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i seeing it in all forms of of society at different wealth, you know, wealth, at least call it wealth brackets. Mm -hmm. You know, the young people are demanding you do things well and properly and make sure that they're taking care of the environment and make sure that there's mm -hmm. contribution from, you know, the people mm -hmm. and for the people. Well, thanks cool. a lot for that interview. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. For my last question would be is this. And I think this could also, your, your lovely wife could answer this question as well. What would be the tip for any foreigner who wants to set up business in Africa? What would be your advice? I mean, I think firstly, always have someone locally that you can rely on and talk to that helps you guide through that, let's call it the unknown, you know, because there's a lot of unknowns and, and local expertise and knowledge of how to do things is I've always found the most critical part. Well, thanks a lot for that. Pleasure. And we wish you well. Yeah, you too. Ah, okay. name of the company, do you want to uh, say it? Wilderness Safaris. Wilderness Safaris. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Cheers. We hope that episode enhanced your life. We post an interview every day as well as vlogging on our social media channel. Don't forget to subscribe to get our latest episode.